Guys and girls, Nathan here. Just thought I'd wait until everyone hops online first. How are we all? Hopefully everyone's having a awesome week, a terrific Tuesday, and uh, thanks for everyone for jumping online and obviously uh, having me as a part of your family viewing on uh, Tuesday evening. So um, just wait for everyone to hop online and got a lot of things happening out there in the news and uh, lots of topics to cover. So um, yeah, we'll get straight into it. So I've um, got a couple of little notes here on my other phone. Um, one because Facebook streaming from uh, one and Instagram streaming from the other. So uh, yeah, with it, um, thanks for the feedback that I'm looking sharp. Hey everyone for tuning in. Uh, I've got the, the tie happening over the day. Got uh, tracksuit pants on the bottom, but I've uh, got the tie happening and the shirt just to uh, you know keep it real and have fun with it. So uh, so yeah, with it. Getting straight into it. So since we caught up last week, there's been a few changes out there in the marketplace, a few things um, occurring out there. Uh, one of them notably um, is the fact that um, the Dow Jones is starting to uh, get cracks in it again. And what are we gonna see? So a lot of people, uh, you know, um, <laughs> uh, seeing all the, the uh, the, uh, the comments coming on. Hey Aileen, I'll get back to you a little bit later with your text, I saw that beforehand. Um, but yeah, we're seeing some interesting things happen out there in the um, the, the, the financial markets. Uh, notably, more cracks occurring. Uh, we've seen last week, uh, the Dow Jones dropped 1800 points in one trading session, uh, which is very, um, um, yeah, with it, um, I'll see comments there, no need to be silly to people, guys, come on. Um, yeah, basically we've seen over the course of the last week some, some volatility in the markets. Uh, will we keep seeing that happening? Why is that happening? Um, what will we see come from this into the future? Um, you know, are we getting ready for the uh, the second wave of this, uh, this crash? And I saw a funny post beforehand, I posted it into um, uh, birch feed. I don't know if it's real or if it's from a, a TV clipping. It looks like it's real from one of the TV shows. And you've got a bull market where it's going up. You've got a bear market and it's going down. Um, I saw this term where they said it's a kangaroo market where it's bouncing along and going up and down, up and down. And uh, you know this is something that we predicted uh, 18 months ago, guys. 24 months ago, we're talking about the markets will be very sharp. Um, in their decline, so we'll go back up, they'll come down, and we're gonna see a lot of volatility um, as we need to navigate ourselves through uncharted waters. So, you know, lots of money printing going on. Since we last caught up, uh, we've obviously seen that $440 billion worth of uh, money that had been printed uh, to get out there in the economy. Uh, after that, we've seen the job, uh, the, the, the home builder package that's come out. Who knows how much that's gonna cost. Um, and about 48 hours ago, Scott Morrison came out and said that he um, is, uh, what, what is this new news article here? We have got 66,000 um, new jobs coming out, and I think it's $75 billion more money being printed. We've got some new infrastructure projects being created. We've got money being printed, work flying around, and trying to build more jobs to keep us away from that old mighty sort of recession. So. Um, looking at it, um, you know, what's going to happen next? Uh, the markets are very, very heavily manipulated. I've posted a bit in the Birch feed talking about the fact that we see the stock markets go down on certain days, up on other days. We see the bond yields being affected. Uh, when bonds go down, we generally see the market go down. It's like everything is tied together. This is a complete manipulation. The, the, um, Basically, um, you know, the, the whole financial system is in a vegetative state. A lot of people are like, should I be selling off my, my property? Should I be uh, paying down some debt? I'm hearing a lot of people, um, you know, talking about buying uh, shares at the moment. Um, you know, are shares good at the moment? Obviously, I'm not your financial advisor. Um, however, you know, we've got to consider what are the parameters? Why 
are these things moving? Why are the markets moving? And I feel that the markets are in a vegetative state, and we're starting to see, you know, the fact that they are zombie sort of, uh, you know, movements that are occurring. So basically, um, we've got a financial system which is dead. We've taped the body around ourselves, and we're walking around with this sort of zombie market, and you know, there's a lot of volatility out there. So, will we see uh, more? You know, catastrophes out there. I believe as we enter from the next quarter, uh, we will start to see the second half of next quarter is when we will start to see a lot more volatility come into the markets and they're going to have to print a hell of a lot more money. The only thing that's been keeping the market alive over the course of the last nine months is the repurchasing agreements and the repo market, uh, which we've talked about a lot extensively beforehand. And, um, you know, we're at a point now where it's, it's becoming very difficult to hold on to that market. So, looking at um, you know some of the news articles from this uh, you know this week that have come out, I've got one here from News.com. Scott Morrison predicts a record downturn for the next two years. So now we've got uh, allegedly, if we can believe what the media has to say, um, an article here that's saying that Scott Morrison predicts a record downturn for the next two years. It goes on to read. Uh, Scamo uh, says he expects Australia to suffer record deficit this year and next. No shit. Uh, you've gone and spent more money and printed more than any other politician in the history of the country and warned it could take up to five years for the economy to recover. Now we're starting to see the ramifications of what really occurred um, you know, during this scandemic. Everyone had their opinion when I said that we're in a scandemic. Everyone thought that I was taking the piss out of, well, not everybody, a lot of you guys, most of you guys are awake, but a lot of people did you know, think that I was you know, being um, too you know, out there by saying it's a scam. Uh, we have a financial, uh, you know, issue here, uh, which is being masked as a health issue. Um, and now, now they're coming out saying that we're going to have a five-year potential sort of recession. So if we have a recession for two years, that will be called a depression. Uh, that's what we talked about two years ago when we called it the global financial depression. So yeah, with it, um, he's gone on to say we have a plan to lift that growth, uh, not just for the next few months, not for now, but for the next five years. He said we need to lift our economic growth rate by more than one percentage point above trend to beat the expected pre-corona GDP position by 2025. So it has to go up to all this extent just to get it to where it was pre-corona. Right? Think of it how fucked the system is if that's what he has to do. Um, there will always be a case made for spending more and spending for a longer. Uh, there will be plenty of people who are happy to make this a case, but he said this is not a wise nor responsible course. Uh, instead, he is again pushing for all sectors of the economy to work together to change existing systems, speed up infrastructure projects, and drag the country out of recession. In an address to CEDA State of the Nation Conference, Canberra, Mr. Morrison pushed his job maker scheme, urging modernisation of how Australia approaches the economy. Mr. Morrison said the joint assessment of teams work on accelerating the projects worth more than 72 billion sorry 72 billion dollars that they printed this week 72 billion more money for everybody to go out in the system who's paying for this where's this money coming from they're the questions i want to know where is it going to go uh, in the grand scheme of things where is it going to go in the economy Who, you know how, how can you benefit how can you have your uh, part of this uh, the newest one it's actually really ironic because last week we spoke about the potential of a, a super fast uh, you know, rail network, and um, as of yesterday, uh, Scamo, the Prime Minister, Crime Minister of Australia, he um, came out and uh, uh, fast-tracked a $10 billion rail network, which is an inland rail network, um, and I posted all the details of this in the Birch Street at about 4 o'clock or 5 o'clock this morning. I'm sorry for everybody that gets waken up by the, hey, <laughs> we've got people here, message me, but, uh, you know, we're... Um, We've got um, uh, side track. Um, yeah, I posted into Birchfeed uh, about three o'clock this morning, four o'clock this morning. Apologies for the people that leave their notifications on and get you know, messages that pop up um, from Birchfeed. But uh, if we look at the infrastructure that's being put in, um, one interesting article that I read last night uh, or this morning or whatever you want to call it is the fact that um, the reason why they if you want to carry something from um, uh, Sydney to Brisbane on a truck or from Melbourne to Brisbane on a truck, it currently it's 36 hours to get it from uh, the port of Melbourne all the way up to Brisbane. 
It takes 36 hours going via truck for one shipping container on the back of a truck. However, um, this new train network uh, will allow for um, 100 double stacked carriages. So basically 100 shipping containers stacked too high. So it'll be 200 shipping containers on a rail network and it can take, that's basically taking 200 trucks off the road um, and getting it there within 24 hours, not 36 hours. So saving time and getting more distribution happening uh, through the country. Uh, ultimately, what that uh, transpires to is that, you know, we need to have growth and these are the corridors that are expanding. I've mentioned uh, briefly that the South East Queensland corridor has got some big growth happening at the moment and things that are being installed at the moment. Um, without going too far into that, uh, one of the articles that I read and I shared was that uh, over the course of the next 20 years, it's expected that Brisbane will go to the city size of an extra 1 million people. Uh, with it, Brisbane expanding an extra 1 million population, um, it is basically, it's said in there that Brisbane will be the size of Sydney in the next 20 years. So where Sydney is today is where they expect Brisbane to be. So you know, these are you know, things that you need to look out for, like you know, worry about, oh, is interest rates going to go up, are they going to go down, and rent's going to be here, rent's not going to be here. You know, they're all like little minor things to look at, but the overall picture is how can you benefit from all this infrastructure spending? How can you benefit from all the liquidity that's being printed? How can you benefit from all the money that's being created and injected in this economy to stop ourselves from going into this big recession that we uh, have to have? So keep an eye out for it. Uh, so some of the projects that have been fast-tracked in that semi well, there was, I think, 11 or 11 projects that were fast-tracked yesterday or 20 or something. Uh, it says here some of the projects are the Brisbane and Melbourne Inland Rail, which is massive. That is a massive project. They expect to be finished in five years. It's going to send a lot of uh, money and connectivity happening through some of that uh, regional Australia uh, in the eastern seaboard uh, on the opposite side of the Great Dividing Range. Um, a New South Wales emergency town water supply, um, Olympic Dam extension, uh, Mar Marinus undersea electricity link between Tasmania and Victoria, so it looks like they're going to connect electricity, um, you know, underneath the, uh, the whatever you'd call it, between uh, Tasmania and, and Melbourne, um, and road, rail and iron ore projects in Western Australia. Woo! Mining boom! Because everyone else is going to have to, um, you know, need out, like, what we haven't even looked at yet is the fact that China's printing money, uh, India's printing money, uh, the ECB's printing money, um, the US is printing money, um, you know, England is printing money, every country around the globe is printing money at the moment. What are they going to do with the money that they're printing? They might be like, well, we need to build infrastructure projects of our own. Where are they going to get their metal from? Where are they going to get their produce from? They're going to have to pull that shit out of the ground. So, you know, that's why opportunities are out there. That's why the markets are moving. A lot of people haven't realised yet um, that, you know, there's a lot of activity out there in the marketplace. And this stimulus that they're printing is finding itself into new homes and it's changing by the week it's growing by the week and uh you know it's exciting um next article is uh, this one's a bit of a um a, a funny one uh it's this article from realestate.com and it says why top bank executives are rushing to sell uh, this is an article that i found last night um and i went on to read it and i will read a little bit out uh, for you. So it's a realestate.com, there's a few articles here, some are realestate.com, some are news.com, uh, just going to have a look at it here. Um, so this one here is a Commonwealth Bank exec, uh, sells, uh, it's listed Bellevue Hill Mansion. Scott Wharton, part of the executive leadership team at Commonwealth Bank. So just remember the news article read why top banks executives are rushing to sell is that because the market's going to crash is it because you know things the sky is going to fall in well once we go on and read the articles here scott wharton part of the executive leadership team here at commonwealth bank is quietly shopping his nine million dollar bellevue hill mansion around through double bay real estate agents it's understood wharton has taken on board the predictions of his bank economists that there are that C word related price drops ahead for the property market between 11 and 32% over the next two years. He's aiming to capitalize now while there's very little competition and tends to buy again in the year or two when he believes the prices will be cheaper. 
let's wait and see. Let's take a, a, a bet against this, this banker. Um, it says here, so buyers are being shown through the seven bedroom, four bathroom home with car park in Strathfield, uh, like whatever it is here. Um, goes on to show the property, the green residence, a beautiful outlook. Who gives a shit what it looks like? Um, um, so that's one of them, right? Now let's go look at the other articles that are attached. There's about 10 articles that are attached. Um, we look up our friend here. This, if you ever think about the news that you watch on TV in the morning, Money Man, Ross Greenwood sells Northbridge home during the scandemic um, for close to $5 million. I know that I've come across certain people on TV. Uh, I know they have to be placed there for advertisers and for media watch and for whatever else they need to do. But let's look at what the experts are making, right? These are the experts. These are the people that people go and respect, listen, watch every morning. They wake up. I wake up and watch these people, right? Whatever the case, I don't wake up. When I wake up, I get my phone, I start my hustle and you know, get on with my day. But it goes on to read, television and radio finance reporter Ross Greenwood has had his property win during the corona scandemic after selling his landmark uh, North Shore home. Mr. Greenwood and his wife Tanya sold the home in April for $5 million, according to CoreLogic. Right? $5 million he sold it for. Uh, the six bedroom house with swimming pool had been the couple's home for the past 17 years, right? Mr. Finance expert Ross Greenwood, let's see what he's made. Uh, he purchased his home in 2003. This guy purchased his home in 2003 for $2.36 million. For those of you that don't know who I'm talking about, this is the fellow I'm talking about, the finance expert extraordinaire here, sold his house for $5 million, held it for 20 years, and paid $2.36 million for it, right? In 2003, interest rates were like 7%, right? Let's just get our calculator out here for a second, just for just for shits and giggles. Um, so let's assume that he has a $2.35 million. Let's just say 2.35. If it's not a mortgage, he could have had the opportunity cost because he's a tremendous investor. He could have at least got, let's say, a 5% uh, return. So let's just assume that he had a mortgage there or the opportunity cost of the mortgage times it by 0 0.05 means $117,000 a year he was either spending on his mortgage or he could have put in assets that would have returned. If he's so great, he would have at least earned a 5% return on his money. So times that by 17 years means that he would have made 1.997 dollars worth of just you know either interest repayments or whatnot. Plus that on the $2.35 million uh, price tag is $4.32 million. So this tremendous finance expert here that, you know, these guys, we've got to think about things that they've said over the years, the way that they look at property, the way that they view things, how they talk to you about the economy, how they brainwash the masses of people and, you know, the psyche of how people think. He's literally paid $4.3 million for an asset that he sold 20 years later for $5 million. Probably not the smartest move, but anyway. He goes on to read, uh, he sold the home, uh, he's taken a sabbatical, um, uh, taken it away from um, uh, media after resigning from his popular 2GB radio program and as the finance editor of Channel 9's Today program. I know that if I want to take a year off, and I ain't calling myself no finance guru on TV or anything like that, I wouldn't be selling my house in order to just take some time off work because I would already be set, right? So, you know, just think about this advice that's being put out there. Uh, he's planned to travel in 2020. Well, fuck, he ain't traveling nowhere in 2020. He ain't getting a plane ticket nowhere. Um, yeah, so just interesting. That's why he sold it. He sold it to travel, right? Is it saying, oh, he's selling because he thinks the property price is gonna fall? No. Um, we've got here, um, so just, just think about that, right? That guy's property doubled. I get asked every day of the week, Nathan, wouldn't it be better to buy a more expensive property? Wouldn't it be more uh, important to buy a property which is going to have um, sort of good uh, growth? Isn't it better growth if it's in, you know, the CBD of Sydney? There's a property in the CBD of Sydney which went up from two and a half mil to five mil in 20 years, right? I know properties that people are picking up two years ago that they paid 254 in Western Sydney and still now selling for 400. If you invested 2.5 mil, it would be worth 4 million, right? It comes on scale. Uh, we look here, 
Citibank, uh, Asia Pacific HR manager. They're trying to make it out that all the bank people are fleeing and all the financial people are fleeing. Just a way of you know conditioning people, right? We've all seen it. Whether we're picking on race out there in the media, it's like, oh wow, let's find something else we can manipulate the psyche and the, the mindset of people by, right? But anyway, uh, it says here, um, uh, Citibank Human Resources Manager, Director Alexander Taylor and her husband Richard have put their Bowmain Semi on the market. The family purchased the property in raw condition 13 years ago uh, for $1.6 million before completing a stunning transformation. It has a $2.75 million price guide and will go to auction later this month with World Property, um, you know, wherever it is, right? Just think about that, right? 13 years. The, they bought the place, right? If these people are some fucking finance gurus and, you know, these are people that people are taking their uh, financial advice from and being persuaded from, right? They're buying properties for $1.6 million. They're spending fucking, what would they spend on their house? They said it's a shit house. It'd be worth $400,000 for a reno, $2 million. And they're selling it 13 years later for 2.75, 750 grand. It would have cost them more than that in interest repayments for holding it for the last 12 years, so, or 13 years. Um, what are they doing with the property? Um, they're looking at selling it. It says here, um, uh, tells about how great the renovation is. Uh, been in their role at Citibank for so long. Congratulations. Um, uh, is an independent consultant. Lovely to hear about it. But they, all these articles are talking about what the people are actually doing with their, their, their money that they sell. Um, here's another one here. This one is quite uh, hilarious. Hedge fund manager Rob Lucino, or whatever his name is, Luce, Rob Luciano, lists his luxury Balmoral beach home for $12.5 million. Right? They're making out like, oh, these bankers are getting out before the market crashes and loses 20% of its value. Hedge fund manager Rob Luciano is set to test the state of his Mossman's prestige market with the listing of his luxury residence overlooking Barrel Beach. The founder of VGI Partners is selling his six bedroom mansion private treaty with a 12.5 to $13.5 million price range. A sale price would see the Petronia home claim the street record by $7 million, right? We're seeing a property got for sale in fucking prime real estate, and it's setting a record by double the amount, right? But, you know, the article made it sound like the market's gonna fall in. Um, uh, the listing follows Mr. Luciano paying $18 million for a six bedroom house on Musman's Golden Mile in February, and his $18 million purchase of a Palm Beach home from Hardy Grant Chairman John Garati. So this guy is selling his one property for $13 million because he just bought two properties for $18 million each. He just spent $36 million, right? Why are all these people going out and buying property, right? Is it because it's a good time? Is it because the property prices are gonna go up? Is it because they just need to have four fucking mansions on Sydney water? Who knows, right? But why does the heading say something that it's not? Um, you know, just interesting. I just like to observe things and see the inconsistencies. Um, I don't understand why that main article where I found that article from had a heading like why the bosses, the bank bosses fleeing the, the property market, right? Why are they fleeing the property market? They're just selling one house because they just spent fucking $50 million on two more mansions. So I don't know. Anyway, um, let's go back to uh, Scamo's um, uh, outline, his details for the government's job maker plan. Uh, what are they going to do, right? Work for the old. Don't worry, we'll give you some jobs. We'll take the debt. We'll set a project, get our slaves. We're talking about slaves recently. We like to be unpolitically correct sometimes. Um, you know, here we are talking about fucking people being on the dole, working for the dole with a job maker platform, right? We've got to get these people, ship them out there. We'll pay them money. When someone pays someone something like that, like when you're, a, a, it's called communism, right? The state is paying for the people to eat, right? We're tax slaves, we're born into this system, go to a 12 year indoctrination camp to become a subservient tax slave. Here we are with the job maker plan. In rail, in rail, inland rail from Melbourne to Brisbane, a second 
underwater power cable to Tasmania along with projects given priority status by the Commonwealth Government uh, in a bid to fast track jobs on major infrastructure works. Why are we just paying people to do jobs, right? Like soon they'll make everyone, oh, we're gonna keep people employed. We'll make fucking car washers and they'll come around and wash your car for you just to give them a job, right? Anyway, um, all this stuff is leading. It's good to see that they're doing infrastructure projects because these infrastructure projects you can sort of buy around, invest around, um, and it creates new markets, new opportunities. Where's that metal going to come from? Is it going to come out of the ground, right? Are we going to see a mining boom? Are we going to see an immigration boom? We are going to see the biggest immigration boom in the country's history over the course of the next three, five, ten years, right? The biggest influx of population, growth in population. Everyone's going to be like, wow, we're booming. Things are so great. It's never been so great. No, it's not. It's just that we need to manipulate the numbers a bit more. So we need more people coming here to pay taxes. And they need shit and buy shit off us. Um, so yeah, uh, gave the speech. 15, it was 15 major projects that were fast-tracked under the agreement by the Commonwealth states and territories to speed up the approval process. Um, that's that. We sort of covered on that beforehand. Um, and there's one, this was the article here. It's, it's from 2019. Um, it's from a little um, sort of independent sort of looking page. It's called queenslandcountrylife.com.au. Sounds really lovely. It sounds like a little local press. Inland Rail set to link Melbourne to Brisbane. Um, it's promoted as a nation building at its best. Why did they start this nation building program before the scandemic? Why did they start all of this infrastructure, all of these stimulus packages? Why did it all happen before now? I don't know. I don't know. We just got something to blame it on now. Right? It was the invisible uh, boogeyman that made a few people sick and a few people die, which were already going to die by the looks of things. Um, I don't mean that any harm to people or any you know, not being thoughtful um, about people that have been affected by it. Uh, based on the 10-year delivery program released in 2015, the first official double stack container train is expected to operate in 2025, double stack being two shipping containers high. Uh, two, two thirds of inland rail project takes advantage of the existing rail corridor, particularly in New South Wales and Victoria, building on decades of investment by the Australian government, states and the Australian rail freight network. In Queensland, it's a different story. Instead of choosing an existing rail corridors, inland rail designers opted for a more direct greenfield route in keeping uh, with the freight system goal of linking the northern and southern capitals in less than 24 hours. I have noticed some people, um, you know, I haven't posted it out there. I haven't talked to people about this. Um, I have noticed that there's some infill sites that occur in just the most randomest towns. Why are they starting building these little estates? When was the last time you drove through a country town and be like, wow, they're building a new estate, like McMansions and shit like that. Why are they building it? What's going to connect in the future? What are the things they're planning? Like, how can you benefit from it? It's just interesting looking at that. So here in Queensland, they're building their own, um, building it through some new suburbs. It's going to be new suburbs there, new opportunities. Um, opportunities to pick up cheap land, purchase stuff, whatever. Um, focus on the construction remains on the route, um, near Toowoomba, um, including crossing the agriculture significant condomine floodplain. Uh, While well, the corridor has been identified, neither the exact route or the construction meta method on the line across the floodplain has been announced to the ongoing frustrated of affected landholders. Um, it goes on here to state that uh, was a really, really exciting. Um, it says here, inland rail provide the critical infrastructure needed to ensure Australia remains competitive by ensuring our freight and supply chain is modernised and productive to deal with the expected doubling of the freight task over the next 20 years. Why in the world would we need to double our freight over the next 20 years? Uh, it goes... On to say, we've seen so successfully in regional towns like parts of New South Wales, inland rail has the potential to reinvigorate regional Queensland well beyond thousands of jobs that will be created during the construction phase. We'll look forward to getting on with the job in Queensland. Um, and the peak to construction, Mr. Wank Muller, that's an interesting name, Mr. Wank Muller, <laughs> it sounds like a politician, uh, said the inland rail project would bring more than 7,000 jobs to the southeast Queensland 
and create national asset that will continue to serve Australia for generations to come. Um, blah, blah, where are we? Uh, we know that between, this is the most important line, guys and girls, we know that between now and 2046, so last year was 2019, 2029, 2039, 25 years, the Brisbane population is projected to grow by 1.6 million people to 4 million, meaning the Brisbane of the future will nearly the size of Sydney today. What would happen, right? When I talk about buying properties up here for $100,000, for $150,000 at a positive cash flow, right? Like, you know, that's the opportunity of the future, right? I'm not looking to, you know, make cash today. I'm looking at building a sustainable strategy that's gonna last me for future generations and many decades to come. So, um, yeah, if we look at the potential, of, I've never seen anywhere else, right? Apart from this one article coming out here, uh, talking about the size of Brisbane expanding to the size of Sydney. Imagine the size of Sydney, right? And dumping it inside of Brisbane. Like, that would be fucking epic, right? I know that all the properties that are gone, all the properties that are purchased for people, they're all going to be like the Balmains of Sydney, where they're like, you know, my mum's nearly 80, and she tells me about, you know, when she was a kid, and she goes, those areas around the city, they were a rat-infested shithole, right? My mum grew up in the North Shore. And looking at you know, these areas now, what are we going to be saying in future generations, right? What about when we have our kids and we have our grandkids and they're sitting there and they're like, oh yeah, we remember when we bought these areas, we wouldn't step foot into, there was graffiti everywhere and stuff, you know, we thought, well, gangsters having to go and buy little, you know, shitty houses or whatever, and now these things are now multi, multi-million dollar sort of properties and sought after. So, yeah, just interesting looking at the opportunity, right? I've talked about the GFD, I've talked about the financial crisis that was coming many years ago. Um, always look for opportunity, folks. This is the opportunity. People are sitting there, you know, thinking that the sky's gonna fall in. Um, you know, there's never been such a great opportunity as now, right? So, hence why I've got my title. Um, on that note, guys and girls, I'm gonna start taking some questions, questions from Instagram. Start with Instagram, we'll go to Facebook. Uh, if you're on Instagram and you're on Facebook, head over to the Be Invested Facebook page, facebook.com slash beinvested.com.au slash live, I think it is, to get this broadcast. Um, and alternatively, and if you guys are on Facebook, I'm on the Instagram page, you're going to look for uh, the Be Invested Instagram page. So, what have we got here? Um, Nathan, hey. Um, we've got Handsome tonight, thank you. Always trying to be handsome. Um, uh, what else have we got here? Questions, any questions from anyone? Taking questions, question. Uh, what do you think the second wave will do to us? Do you think we will recover uh, while the borders are closed? Um, I think we're still gonna, like, we're gonna have to create, right? And that's where we're gonna start seeing these infrastructure projects. So the people that the business is not going to go back how it was beforehand, right? Go to the shops, see no one's going to the shops. Look at the shopping center in the food court, there's no chairs. Everyone's like hitting those little things, getting their soap, washing their hands, putting the mask on, thinking that fucking the boogeyman's going to get them, whatever the case may be. People aren't going to go back for a very long time, right? Every week, imagine these businesses that had like a 2% margin, a 5% margin. The margins that were in these businesses and the impact that's been occurred, right? It's people that are on JobKeeper today, it's people that are on Job Seeker, they're never going back to the old job, right? They're never going back to the old fucking job in the history, right? You need to look at new ways of how you're going to get ahead. Are you going to be stuck there, um, plugged into the social socialist sort of uh, system where they're feeding you social security checks every fortnight? Um, or are you going to create a way which is going to give you income streams that's going to be able to support you and your family. So there will be a lot of markets that will not recover. Um, you know, will the borders reopen anytime soon? I don't know. Probably not. Um, you know, how bad and how deep will this go? Um, this is going to go on for years, right? This this will create the best decade. Right? People are fearful. That everyone's scared at the moment. All of this money that's being printed, or currency, as it really is. Um, all of this currency that's being created at the moment is going to um, you know, flow into the system 
and this eventually was going to cause the demise of our currency and the death of our dollar. There was another article that I saw the other day and I posted in the Birch feed and I forgot to share with you guys this evening uh, and it was talking about the removal of the 10 five cent pieces. So five cent pieces are now on the chopping block, boom. 10 cent pieces are on the chopping block, boom, right? Um, you know, what's gonna, what, why are they removing this currency? It's because it's worthless, it's losing its value, right? I remember when I was in kindergarten in 1990, right? I was in kindergarten and um, I went and uh, purchased uh, at school at the canteen, uh, like fucking red frogs, those little, uh, balls which are like apricot with coconut on the outside you get 10 of them for 10 cents right i'm showing my age now but you know looking at it nowadays like a dollar who even wants a dollar like you probably go and buy a red frog for a dollar now right like this lost 100 percent of its value over the course of the last three decades right coins are worthless i remember one and two cent pieces in the early 90s like oh wow what happened to those coins i don't know they just didn't ask a question at the time so what will the second wave of um you know of this take what will the economic cost of that be uh, we will wait and see in around september october and it's not like people have been asking what's going to happen when job keeper came a couple of finishes in, in around that period of time i was talking to you guys before job keeper even came out uh, to the public um, that we would see a second wave the second wave is the economic challenge which is when we start seeing that all of these uh, zombie companies, all the companies that are out in the marketplace are insolvent, they're trading insolvent, and um, you know, they're bankrupt companies, they're zombie companies. So, uh, I think it will be very interesting. They are needing to prop up the market. Someone that was, you know, in a job beforehand, oh wow, you can go earn some. How many people years ago when the mining boom came in, oh, you know, I can go get a job driving trucks for the mines, right? I can go get a job in the mines doing this. They're just going to create. Right, where's this money going, right? They're manipulating the balance book. They're taking it, instead of saying, oh, we've got all these people that are unemployed. No, you've got job keeper, you've got job seeker, you've got job maker, you've got, you know, oh, we're gonna keep the property market alive. Let's just give everyone 25 grand to go buy a property, right? So think about it. If you're a first home buyer, right? You can get the first home buyer grant, 10 grand. You don't have to pay stamp duty, right? You get 25,000 new home building grants. So it's 35 grand plus no stamp duty, right? Plus you can go get the 5% deposit, right? And the government pay the extra 15% for a first time. Owner. So technically you're getting paid to take a fucking house out of the marketplace, right? Someone's going to create it. It's insane. Right? But the biggest thing that's going to occur um, is that we're going to see these companies in September, August, August. Right. So early as August, late as October, I start seeing these companies roll over. That never recovered, never recovered. Right. Don't worry about the coronavirus. Watch out about these fucking businesses that are dead. Um, which state or city should I buy my first investment property? Um, I don't like to speculate on state or cities or locations. People always ask me, what's the hottest pick? There was actually this, this quote that I saw the other day um, and it was interesting. Uh, I keep saying things are interesting, right? Living on hot tips will send you to the poor house, right? Living on hot tips will send you to the poor house. If you're looking for the get rich quick, the hype, right? Strategy, structure, treat your investing like a business, right? Treat your investing like a business. Why aren't I concerned about what happens to Bitcoin prices? Why aren't I concerned about what happens to silver prices? Why aren't I concerned about what happens to gold prices? Why aren't I concerned about the price of the petrol I put in my car? Well, some of my cars chew so much petrol that I should really get. I don't even know what the fuck price petrol costs out there, right? But I know that I've got hedges against things, right? So when I buy Bitcoin, I'm buying with a hedge. When I purchase precious metals, I'm buying with a hedge. When I'm taking on debt, I'm using it in effect as a hedge against to a failing dollar, a failing currency. Um, I'm looking for the fundamentals rather than the outer market. So uh, for me, when I buy properties, predominantly I like to buy them in capital cities, whether it be Sydney, Brisbane, Gold Coast, Adelaide, Perth, any of the states territories I buy in. Uh, I'm not a fan of the territories, uh, just don't gel well with me, um, and they're too expensive for what they are. Um, and yeah, like I have my favorite places that I go to. I do like capital cities. Uh, but it doesn't stop me 
from buying a property for ten thousand dollars out in the sticks, right? I'm seeing people out there that are like, "Fuck, I can't get a property or whatever." I've seen people literally, right? And it's not something that I'd advise to do. Uh, as always, I'm not anybody here's financial advisor. Uh, I might look like one with my suit and tie on today, but um, you know what I've seen people out there doing is using their super, right? They might use their ten thousand dollars out of their super. Um, to then go and purchase an asset catch, right? People are using it to go buy a block of land or Bitcoin or whatever the case may be, right? Do know when people take their money at the super, you are stopping yourself from buying a property for a period of six months minimum, right? So um, I've seen an ample amount of people at the moment who put their mortgages on hold. They're not buying a property for the next six months, right? Uh, minimum, right? If they stopped their mortgage freeze today, they wouldn't be buying a property for six months. If they've still got another four months to go, add another six months on top of that, you're not buying a property till next financial year, all right? Be very careful if you're pulling your money out of your super. Be very careful if you're mortgage freezing their mortgages because it will uh, affect you. As for what city to buy, it needs to be in line with your strategy, in line with your plan, um, and you know, obviously part of your, your acquisitions. Um, you know, at different stages in your portfolio, you might need cash flow. At different stages, you might need equity in your portfolio. You would need different assets in order to achieve those tasks. Without knowing the you know the parameters of your position, it's hard to give you sort of feedback on that front. But if you would like uh, to have a strategy session, um, I do these things called a map session. You can call my office on one 365 email us at admin at beinvested.com.au and organize a map session. A map session is a strategy session, which is with myself. I have a look over your position, help you work out a property acquisition plan, um, and you know, give you the guidance of what you need to do, get you set up, put you in contact with the right people, and whatnot. So if you would like to uh, organize a map session, my time is very, very limited. Um, I you know, have very small amounts of time available for these. Um, speak to my staff, they can book it in, they handle my calendar. Uh, I do do a couple of them uh, every day of the week. Um, I have been booked out until sort of September um, with some portfolio reviews, which I've had to stop. But um, you know, the map sessions with myself, working out a strategy of acquisition and what to buy, where to buy, how to buy, all that sort of stuff. That's what we sort of cover in that. So feel free to reach, reach out to my office. Uh, into agriculture, that's where the buck starts. Yeah, look, there's, um, there's, there's a lot of people out there that are wanting to purchase cheap assets at the moment, right? There's lots of markets. I know the markets. I know when I look at the data on what is under contract, in what corners of the state, in what corners of the country, all these people that get data and go, oh, well, I've got some, you know, stats on six months ago. And you, know, you can pull the stats of March and go, oh, well, look, everything collapsed, right? Does that mean it's going to collapse next month? Everything's booming at the moment, right? In, in January, everything's booming, right? Does that mean that March is going to be booming? No, it doesn't. But you can see the writing on the wall from activity that's happening out there in certain markets. And uh, obviously, you know, in the current market, we're starting to see some very interesting trends occur with where money is being invested, uh, who is investing money into certain areas, what that would mean into the bigger scope of where the future will lay. And it's just interesting. So thanks for sharing that, Jennifer. Uh, we've got some pictures here of some cow, sheep, lambs, pigs, fruits, vegetables, and whatnot. Um, what do I think will happen to the property prices for the next couple of years? What 99.9% .9 of the economy or population that watch those morning show actors and the people that are out there acting and giving you the advice and programming and social conditioning for our lives and how you should live, how you should be, and the fake world we live in, um, you know, they're saying that this is going to happen, that's going to happen, to exactly what's going to happen, right? We have got an average price to say that a house is worth 500000 and your interest rate was 5% beforehand. 500000 interest rate of 5% is $25,000 a year. Interest rate goes down on that 500,000 to two and a half percent. Suddenly, uh, your interest bill has gone down to twelve and a half thousand dollars a year. Suddenly, you've got better servicing, so you can borrow more at the banks. Suddenly, with the extra uh, cash flow, uh, you know, the property can go up to a million dollars, and at two and a half percent, it'd be 25 grand, which is what you're paying at five percent 
on the half million dollars beforehand. So with the manipulation of different things out in the currency supply, we're starting to see, um, you know, whether where's it going to head to? I believe we're at the very early stages of a property boom. Right? We have seen a market crash from 2017, 2018, 2019, and it started to recover again in 2019 when we manipulated our currency. So you know, people ask me, like, why didn't the market collapse in 2018? Well, it fucking did. It collapsed in many different ways that people didn't even realize. They don't even realize today that the market collapsed, but it's recovering uh, due to the the levers that have been pulled out there. So uh, I'm very, very optimistic, right? Two years ago, three years ago, people were like, Nathan, like, come on, man. Like, you're the property spruker, right? People think they're my property spruker. And they're like, why is he being a doomsday, right? People call me a doomsday, right? I'm not a doomsday. I'm just looking at what's happening out there in the marketplace. And I'm seeing it before it happens. It's like seeing a train wreck. Like, well, that guy's speeding. He's going to fall off a cliff, right? It's going to happen, right? If you're heading in that direction and you can't break on quick enough, you can see that you're going to be impacted at some position and um, the activity that's happening at the moment is going to see market explode so that's my thoughts on the market no financial advice of course um, uh, should have bought a farm um, <laughs> they don't call you the king of areas for nothing uh, I don't know what, what that was regards so I think maybe I said gangster in those areas but uh, yeah look it's um, uh, yeah it's uh, the hustle the hustle's real um, have you got some indigestion? Need my lanta? No, I haven't got indigestion. I'm, I'm all good. I'm on my chair, which is rocking, so I don't know if that's coming through the, the, the thing. Um, so they get out rich. The next poor prick goes ass up buying it. That's bullshit. It is. It's a system we're in. But we're at a point now, uh, because we're in a debt-based fiat Ponzi scheme, um, we're in a debt-based system, so it's not... Uh, in the interest to see deflation, we need to see inflation to keep this system alive. So they're just going to keep inflating it, keep reinflating it, keep pushing this boom into the next one, kicking the can down the road, however one would want to call it, and seeing the um, you know this bubble get bigger and bigger and bigger. And ultimately, it's the currency that's going to die. It's the currency that's going to top the whole brunt of this storm. Um, uh, yeah, uh, we got immigration, yes. Uh, in the place of solving a point, a car. Eh? Uh, when, when do you live in the future? I try and live in the future 23 out of 24 hours of the day. So, um, rent might not go on, but everyone buys a new house. Look, I quite like, like people say, oh, what happens if, you know, the house market collapses, right? What happens if there's no buyers out there? Well, if there's no buyers, and it's a big recession, well then everybody's not gonna be able to buy, they're gonna to need to be renting a property, right? So when rents will increase, so is it gonna be capital appreciation or cash flow appreciation? One might take a hit at some point in, in, uh, in the cycle, however, what are you gonna benefit from? So yeah, it's not always about the rent, um, yeah. Um, why are we not investing Anywhere along the Great Dividing Range, fertile land that only cheap because we are underpopulated, forget the rest of the country, only get lucky if we discover the resource. Good point. Um, you know, there's some very good agriculture land out there, right? People are just trapped in the city. People would love to live on the on the on the farm and on, you know, live, live on the land. So, you know, there is opportunities out there for building a sustainable property portfolio. The finance becomes a bit more difficult as you go on the farmland, especially over 25 acres. Uh, the land becomes more, um, you know, commercial in nature, and uh, you know, lending becomes more tougher. But yeah, um, everyone should be buying out there, buying at least some sort of property. Imagine if everyone just went out there, right? Everyone's buying Bitcoin and shit like that, which is cool. I love Bitcoin, I've got heaps of it. But imagine if people just went and bought blocks of land. You buy blocks of land for like ten thousand, fifteen thousand, twenty thousand dollars. Um, you know, these areas will see growth in the future. So. You know, I'm very, very confident of it, just due to the fact, like, the, the amount of inflation that's to come, right? Like, anyone can get access to 10,000 at the moment, get access to 20,000 at the moment. So people are going to start, imagine you buy a block of land out of Wookwell, build a dwelling on it, and you get yourself 25 grand, you know, the land costs you nothing, right? So just interesting things to, uh, to look at. Uh, no question, thank you, just the helpful info as always. Uh, do you smoke 
s cigar, I think it is. Do I smoke cigar? Uh, I don't smoke anymore. I used to smoke two packs of cigarettes a day. I love smoking. Um, I quit 18 months ago. Um, I still miss it a little bit, um, but I went cold turkey from smoking. So um, yeah, if I had a cigarette, I know that if I had one puff of a cigarette, I'll be straight back in the shops via two packs of smoke today, and it wouldn't be pretty. So I'll try and be more um, more healthy nowadays. So 64 bucks a pack, maybe. Um, uh, Dan, you mentioned a lot on the Gold Coast uh, about being beneficiary of Brisbane growth. What about Inland 2 towards and around Ipswich? Uh, not a big fan of Ipswich. I'd be rather be in that corridor of Gold Coast to Brisbane rather than Ipswich. Uh, opportunities are out there. I do own properties in Ipswich, uh, but a lot of the area around Ipswich is flood affected. So for growth and future expansion and stuff like that, it becomes a bit harder uh, for them to infill those areas. So a lot of the infrastructure projects might either go straight through it um, or go and divert around a different area. So mainly due to the flooding, uh, that's why I prefer um, all the way up the coast rather than inland, but I do buy inland, I do buy there. Um, but it's just, you know, a lot of people go and jump in there and I'm thinking like, you could buy for the same money elsewhere. Um, I cannot wait to get some Brisbane properties um, in my life, Jenny reach out, I'm uh, happy to help out wherever I can. Um, I love buying Queensland properties up there. Um, the trucks are gonna be driven without people in the mines. It's an interesting world we're growing into. Um, after five years, I've got to pay interest and principal. I'm worrying my cash flow might come to an end. Adam, reach out um, to my office. Send us an email at admin at beinvested.com.au. Um, there is a lot of people that I'm helping at the moment restructure the debt. There is a small window uh, of opportunity. Um, I run, a uh, apart from running Australia's sort of second buyer's agent that was out there, uh, which has been around for 11 years, um, I run um, many different other businesses, law firm, accounts practice, financial planning, real estate offices nationally. Um, one of my core business, one of my main businesses is a finance company. And um, basically we specialize in structuring debt um, and having the right uh, sort of debt plans for people to be able to acquire their assets and especially after once they dispose of the assets how they can plan so not just when we do loans it's not just a matter of like okay here's a loan best interest rate whatever the case may be we need to look at the tenure of that loan product and think okay what about in two years in five years in 10 years in 15 and 20 years time how's this debt product going to get you to where you need to be and there's a lot of people out there at the moment which are refinancing, restructuring, especially due to the fact that it's easier to get money at the moment. Um, it's still hard, but you know it's much easier than what it was beforehand. Um, and the opportunity to refinance for it being principal interest to interest only again, and having another five years of better cash flow. So if you would like to um, you know, be helped, you can uh, reach out, just flick us a, an email at admin at beinvested.com.au, just say finance in the subject and put a little bit of uh, content in there. Opportunity to contact, and with my own personal broker, my personal broker, uh, Rose, who now has come on board to uh, to help out and lead my team, um, has been my broker for the last 15 years. So she's done about 80% of my own personal loans in my portfolio. Um, so yeah, with it, if you'd like to, you know, it's a big difference between having one or two properties, 10 or 20 properties, or 100 or 200 properties, they're big numbers to over, overcome. So getting the right debt strategy is, uh, is very, very crucial. So feel free to, reach out and happy to help out where I can. Uh, Jenny, I have a map session booked and cannot wait to talk about future planning. Awesome, Jenny. I look forward to uh, chatting to you shortly when we do catch up and, and helping you out and being part of your journey and helping you kick ass. There's, there's lots of cool stories that I hear when I do uh, speak to people on map sessions because I, I don't always know, right? Like there's, in, in Instagram, I think there's maybe 4,000 people or something. In the Facebook world, I've got about 30,000 people here and a database of about 50,000 people. And you know, I'm looking to see like all these stats that come out, right? For example, ATO has said that there's uh, less than 17,000 people in the country which have six plus properties in their portfolio. Out of 17,000 people, I think we've played some sort of role in some capacity in probably half of the people getting there to that sort of good position in their portfolio. And, you know, it's, it's humbling seeing the stories that you know, people get from just watching videos and whatnot. And when I get the opportunity to you know, have a strategy session or, or meet someone, uh, it's really cool to see. So I look forward to chatting to you, Jenny. 
uh, when we have our MAP session. If people want to have a MAP session, reach out to my office and we will, um, uh, yeah, I'll be in touch with you shortly. Phil, shirt and tie, are you well? Mate, we're going to catch up, mate. I've been wearing a suit and tie. Not a suit and tie, just I've got uh, my, my track suit pants on because I'm about to go for a walk. I um been wearing suit and thongs uh, recently just because I've got some new, uh, new new team members in the business and uh, I want to have a, a different culture, different precedence and um, you know, take things to the next level. I, I can't build a bank wearing tracksuit pants every day. Um, so I've got some big uh, big goals as a part of the business to uh, to kick and you know, sometimes we've got to you know, do things differently. So I still wear thongs every day. I'm not going to wear shoes. I'm never going to buy shoes ever again. Jezza, I'll see you some 10 acre blocks, 100 k's from Adelaide. Um, it's cool. Uh, I've got heaps and heaps of like large blocks of land that I've been buying over the course of the last couple of years just to, to land bank and um, seeing these infrastructure projects roll out as we're talking about for those of you who are joining on now. Those infrastructure projects rolling out over the course of the next you know, like 5, 10, 15, 20 years. It's going to be really, really exciting. And, you know, lots of wealth will be created there as well. Um, are commercial properties a better investment than residential properties? Um, I uh, Some of my favourite properties have come as commercial, but I don't buy commercial for people um, in their early days. I think it's important to get the foundations right. If you think about it, the bank will only lend like 40%. Uh, you have to put down a 40% deposit. Um, they could sit vacant for two, three years at a time. There is a much higher risk. It's harder to get in there, pull the equity out, be able to structure that portfolio correctly from a finance strategy. Um, so I see an extra uh, unneeded uh, layer of risk when buying uh, commercial properties. Uh, I generally get better sort of, uh, <laughs> I generally get better returns on residential properties. Phil, uh, we both know the property that you're talking about. That is my favorite property. And thank you once again for helping me uh, obtain that property many years ago. So, uh, yeah, with it, I'm um, going to head over to Facebook and uh, answer some of your questions. Uh, looking sharp, looking sharp, looking snazzy with the tie. Thank you. I uh, hope you still have thongs on. I've got no shoes on. Uh, you're late, boss. Aline, uh, yes, I'm late to replying to your messages <laughs> beforehand. Seven, good day, sir. Hope you're doing well, Steve. Uh, you look like you went to a job interview. Um, no, I've just been wearing it just for, for fun. People around, I had um, one of my new senior staff that, uh, that started uh, today in the business. Like we just recruited, a, you know, I don't even know, I think we've got like 10 new staff in the business. And um, she goes, oh, you look really relaxed, Nathan. And I was like, why? And she's like, oh, you got thongs? And I'm like, no, no. I'm wearing a suit. I normally wear tracksuit pants and a and a and a, and a t-shirt and uh, and jeans and thongs. So, yeah, it's uh, I'm not going to stop wearing the thong. So no one's going to stop that. So, especially when you're in those areas, right? If you go out to an area and you've got to do the runner quickly, you know, like you got to you know you can run fast in those thongs. So, uh, Tommy, uh, I've got white suspenders and a mad vest that would look great on that blue setup you got. Thanks, mate. Uh, I'll, I'll wear some different ones time moving forward. I used to wear suits a lot when I was younger, but I just haven't worn them in the last few years. Uh, you can bet Scammer on the police will be enjoying their large salaries during this pain. They're not, their salaries aren't going to be that good when inflation hits, right? They're still going to be screwed as well. Gail, hope you're doing well. Are you doing an awesome job there in Queensland? It looks like I've got uh, a few of my team here online watching Facebook this evening from uh, from Queensland. So if you guys have got uh, properties in Sydney or Brisbane or Gold Coast or anywhere in Queensland, we actually cover from coast to coast of, uh, of, of Queensland. Um, make sure you hit up my team. I've got a really awesome team uh, which help manage and, and get the highest rental returns um, you know, on, on investments. So um, feel free to hit us up. Good to see you online. Uh, John and Nathan, great work. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, Luke, virtue Tuesday, Nathan, we're in a time, mate. You've just been at the job interview. No, not at the job interview. Just, uh, just mixing it up a little bit, just for, for the fun of it. Uh, Selda, where's Nathan? Who's this? Well, the tie. Um, have you got things at the thongs under the desk? Yes, looking sharp, looking sharp. Good riddance uh, to them as they're speculators and not investors. Uh, for real honesty, yes, I say it as it is. I love how matter of fact you speak. Such a refreshing, positive. Thanks, Jessica. I'll just say it as it is. There's uh, lots of bullshit out there in the world. 
um, and I just want to keep it real. Uh, Josh, I know where they'll uh, house immigration boom. Thanks to you, mate. Good to see you. I'm sorry I didn't get back your text recently, Josh. Really excited to see you uh, kicking ass with your uh, with your journey. So it's um, it's really cool. Um, and I'm going to chase up. I don't know if you had the conversation with something the other day, but I've, I've got something else to chase up for you as well. Uh, Jonathan, where would you be investing right now? Um, Right, we're just going to go back to Instagram. I only have a one hour video on Instagram. So uh, I get Instagram, thought I'd let you back in this evening. Um, where would I be investing right now? Um, I'm investing in, you know, I'm trying to get rid of that, that fiat cash, right? I don't want cash flow. So I want cash flowing into my bank account. I don't want to hold on to the cash flow. I want it back out of my account and I want to be collecting assets, very, very specifically collecting assets in this marketplace. Um, cash flow is the most important thing. So um, yeah, with it, any assets producing cash flow, awesome. Um, assets that are below market value, assets that have had the downside risk removed. Um, predominantly like property is what I talk about a lot out there. Um, I like to touch on lots of different interesting uh, subjects. That's why I call the business Be Invested 11 years ago when I started it and not Birchie's property or whatever, you know, people put these property groups, whatever. Um, as for where um, the, the properties are that, um, you know, to be buying, I buy nationally. I'm, you know, I did a fly the other day. Um, one of my team wanted a, you know, one of my new team wanted um, you know, something like a flow chart or something. And I was like, okay, I'll get a few example properties and, and throw them in. I was like, I want to um, mix it up a little bit for everybody. So just like in the tie, what's with the tie? Just wearing the tie just for, for the fun of it. Um, I haven't been to a job interview for everyone. But um, with it, um, yeah, with, what was I going to say actually? Um, Yes, putting together uh, the, the flow chart. And um, on the flow chart, uh, I was like, I don't want it to have all the one type of property. I want to show and showcase a few examples of some of the sort of deals that you know I've done over the last few years. And um, the flow chart, thanks, Lindsay. Uh, and with the, uh, with the flow chart, um, I put in there some different types of deals and properties to show examples, sort of portfolios of what they could look like and, and whatnot. And I was pulling properties from like war clues, right? People think Nathan Birch, that's that guy from Western Sydney, he grew up in Mount Druid. I never grew up in Mount Druid. I grew up in the Hills District in Western Sydney. Um, I bought in Mount Druid. Um, but yeah, they think that I just buy crap properties. I pick up properties in the Eastern Suburbs. I pick up properties in war clues, which is the most expensive uh, suburb of Sydney, um, and I buy properties in the cheapest shitholes at ten thousand dollars for a block of land, or fifteen thousand dollars for a unit, or uh, two hundred thousand dollars for a unit in Sydney, or one hundred and fifty thousand for a unit in Brisbane. Um, it depends what you need in your portfolio to get you to where you need to be in the future. So the asset has to be able to take you to where you need to be for your next destination. So it's important to have the strategy on accumulation strategy on obtaining debt, a strategy of um, diversification, a strategy on risk minimization, a strategy from all different aspects. So where should that property be that you should invest into? Who knows? It could be out there anywhere, right? Um, it's just a matter of finding the right, uh, the right assets that's in line with your goals. Uh, what are your thoughts on projections on the current cryptocurrency market, i.e. Ripple XRP? Um, Ripple is dog shit, in my opinion. Um, I do not like it, I'm sorry. I probably offended half the people out there that thinks that cryptocurrency is going to be adopted by the banks and Ripple is gonna, I call it Cripple, because uh, it's Cripple. <coughs> um, the reason why I don't like Ripple is that over 50% of it is controlled by one entity. So it's not decentralized, it's very centralized. No one knows who owns it. Um, however, it's being created by banksters. 
So cryptocurrencies are meant to be anti-banksters. People are saying, well, this coin is going to be injected into the banks. They're not going to take it, guys. They're not going to take it. So potentially, I could be wrong. Um, I bought one of my first cryptocurrencies was Cripple. Um, I did it online out of it. Uh, then the market went backwards and I sold it very, very cheaply, like very cheap. It was in like the micro sense. And um, I was happy with the decision. I could have made millions of dollars on it, but the day I found out what it was, I was like, this is shit and it doesn't sit in line with my goals, uh, in line with you know who I am. So I don't actually have a belief. And it's not in line with my belief system to carry that. But as for other crypto projects, um, you know, as money is being injected into the system, if you notice the crypto market collapses, the Dow Jones collapses, so the bond market collapses, all these markets are very collect connected. They're stuck, they're stuck, right? So uh, I was saying beforehand, you've got the bull market, the bear market, and I don't know if it's real or not. I put the little laughy cry faces when I posted on Birchfeed. For those of you that are on Birchfeed, if you're not on Birchfeed, go to birchfeed.com. It's free, post up daily, all the time. Um, and it said a kangaroo marker, right? And I just thought it was funny just because it's on. If that was real from TV, it's really fucking funny. But if it's, um, if it's not, it's still funny, right? Because we're going to be in this market, which is just up and down, up and down, but stuck in sort of like a, a, a time lapse, right? And just orbiting in outer space. It's, but um, these markets are going to flow um, uh, you know, whether it be the Dow Jones, whether it be the crypto market, as they print more money, where's people going to spend their stimulus checks? They might spend on some toilet paper, might put in the savings for a little while, might put in the crypto to see it pump, um, you know, whatever the case may be. But I do believe that we will see, a, you know, a good future for crypto, just due to the fact of the amount of manipulation of the currency supply we've got out there. It's going to, yeah, flow through it. Um, Matt, what is your thoughts on Coomera north of the Gold Coast? I know Coomera well. Um, it's, I actually saw some of my staff in here before, and we've got an office. We've got about uh, 15 staff on the Gold Coast, a dozen staff on the Gold Coast. Um, and we do a lot of um, you know management of properties out there. Um, I do own properties in Coomera. Depends on the purchase price, depending on what the property is. Um, you know, there's lots of fundamentals there. But you know, is it an area where I'd invest in? I have purchase there, but would I buy anything that's out there? Would I buy everything that's out there? Is it the right thing for you? What is the right price to be purchasing? What property at the what price should we be buying? There's lots of variables there. But if you'd like to chat a little bit about it, Matt, you can reach out to my team, uh, send us a message on here. Um, flick us an email, admin at beinvested.com.au or give us a buzz, 1-300-367-925 and chat to my team a little bit about strategy on that front. Um, uh, Pedro, uh, hey Nathan, I just bought a house in February. I believe that I have some equity. You reckon it's possible to start buying investment properties with just equity with no deposit in my account? Want to start ASAP. Thanks for your content. You, have a machine, you are a machine, bro. I hope to talk to you soon. Pedro, appreciate the support. Appreciate the, the, the cool vibes and you know, humbled to be of a, a motivation um, for you. Um, if you'd like, reach out to my team. Um, I will just send an email to my team uh, to say finance, Facebook Live, Nathan told me to message in. Um, I'll get my finance guys to have a look at your property, see what valuations we can run. A lot of people don't realize that they've got a lot of capital there in their position to be able to do um, to do things. So. You know, it's not, you know, you might have bought a property for 200, and you might be like, well, has it gone up in value, right? One bank might value it at 190, one bank might value it at 250, some banks might value it at 220. Um, you know, the importance of having someone that understands finance and structuring of debt is knowing which lender to take the asset to to get the best outcome for you. So um, reach out to my team, see if they can help you and uh, get from that first one into a second one and, and build out that portfolio. It's definitely an awesome time to take advantage. And whilst most people are scared of stocking up on toilet paper, you want to be stacking up on assets. Elliot, uh, what is a good source to buy currencies collecting? Thank you. You mentioned past video that you picked up some cheap notes, etc. Um, oh, eBay, be very careful. Um, on, on, on eBay um, because there's a lot of scams out there. I know what I look for. There's some specific, I actually saw about 
20 auctions end on my phone over here uh, with Instagram streaming earlier on saying, you got it, you got it, you got it. Uh, awesome, awesome stock, right? Like I just put bids out there randomly and um, I have uh, people coming in. I accidentally sent a, a poster virtually the other day. Someone may have seen it. I, I got rid of it pretty quickly. I was sending it to a mate. But um, I have um, uh, pneumostatic um, collectors which come and um, drop off at certain locations, um, you know, currencies, and sometimes people uh, collect them um, and, and purchase them. But you know, the leftover stuff that doesn't get exported out of the country. So um, a lot of people actually collect from China, and there's people out there that go and um, you know do auctions and whatnot, and they pick up deceased estates and whatnot. It's a totally geeky sort of world on that front. But you could um, find someone like that. Um, you could uh, just go to some coin dealers and start talking to them. Um, the thing I like about coin dealers is that, like coin shops, there's a lot of them, they're not you know, a, a commodity investor. Right? They're just uh, someone that's collecting a, um, you know, coins. They might have like a nice penny or they might have you know, some um, set that they'd sell. They just get stuff from the Australian men and they become a seller for it or whatever, but they might have some stuff out the back before the prices jumped and you can pick up cheap stocks. So whilst everyone was worried about being able to secure bullion and pick up like gold and silver, um, you know, I went out and cleared out a lot of, um, you know, coin dealers, right? And uh, those, those uh, assets went away and got put away. Um, and, you know, and it's not like big amounts, right? It could just be like a thousand bucks here, two thousand dollars there, five dollars here, hundred dollars there, fifty dollars here, whatever. Um, but have a strategy, right? And a lot of people ask me, like, should I go out and buy lots of gold? Should I go out and buy money and, and, and currency? Should I say, sorry? Um, and, and, and whatnot. I only, I started investing when I was like 14 years old. I was like, couldn't buy anything else, right? It was like 99, um, 2000. I had a girlfriend, I'd catch a train from like Parramatta to Penrith. Um, and uh, yeah, with it, I'd, well, Richmond, and um, there's like coin shops at the train station. I remember I'd go to the coin shop and start collecting coins. And I was like, bought this coin that was like just a normal $1 coin. It went to like 200 bucks from five bucks to 200 bucks. And I was like, wow, imagine if I had like a hundred of them, right? I would have made like, you know, 20 grand, uh, two grand. And, um, you know, I started collecting stuff and I didn't realize and understand uh, precious metals at the early point. Um, I started realizing that, you know, around the mid 2000s. Um, and you know, I just collect it. Like I don't um, go out there and you know put ten grand into it. I don't go put twenty grand uh, into um, you know uh, metal at a time. Uh, that's a deposit, right? That'd be stupid to tie up that much cash. But if you do have a little bit of um, spare cash and you're not doing anything at the time, and you find the opportunity to pick up something cheap and below market value. Um, you know, that's when I always find the opportunity to go buy these sorts of things. So um, there's some bullion dealers out there which sell, you know, precious metal, like just bullion grade stuff. Um, I have bought it from the Perth Mint. I don't like buying much stuff from there because um, they can see what you've got. Um, be careful who you're buying it from because people will try and, you know, rob you or whatever. So, um, yeah, like it's, it's really important to work out, you know, sort of protect your wealth from that front. So uh, I want to buy, but I'm worried uh, about a crash in prices, but being stuck with bad tenants, I understand uh, you have lots of properties. They can help balance payments because not all tenants will be bad, but buying one or two is scary because I would not be uh, able to continue funding the property if bad luck I get a tenant who does not pay. Can you help me understand this side of property investing side? Good question, uh, Urkan. Um, so what happens if you buy a property, tenant doesn't pay rent, you've got no tenant, whatever the case may be, you have to pay the mortgage. That's why I like buying properties on the low end of the scale. If you've got a $200,000 mortgage and you've got to pay that, it might be like $200 a week. Um, it's not like paying a $500 mortgage with no tenant. Um, it's, it's a much smaller mortgage to have to cover. It might only be a $150,000 or a $100,000 mortgage, which could just be like $100 a week that you'd have to cover. And it might only be for a period of two or three months. So if you can have a buffer set aside for like three months worth of mortgage repayments or four months worth, five months worth of mortgage repayments for a property, um, 
It's always important to have a buffer in place. Second of all, make sure you've got landlord insurance. So if the tenant fucks up, destroys the place, I love when a tenant destroys a place, right? They destroy it, uh, my staff call me, or you know, a property manager would call me and be like, oh, Nathan, I've got some really bad news to tell you. A tenant destroyed the house, blah, blah. First question is, my insurance paid, right? I wanna make sure my insurance pays. When they tell me insurance pays, I was like, oh, that's pretty good, right? I've got myself a free renovation, right? So it's minimizing risk along the way. So, you know, like I've had points where I have like 10 properties vacant, 15 properties over time. Some of them might need work. So I might have 10 properties vacant, three of them might need work. So there's like 10 grand each. There's 30 grand needing some work and uh, 10 properties vacant at 400 bucks a week rent. That's $4,000 a week that I'm losing as well. It happens, right? But you have to factor that into your cash flow. So when I do my cash flow analysis, I sort of leave a buffer in place to cover if there is a, a period where work needs to be done. If there is an arrears, generally if the tenant screws up um, and you have the property vacant or not collecting rent for that period of time, you just need to pay it now. Then the insurance policy comes out, they pay you for it, and then you put that back into your buffer and you keep going as life had never changed, apart from you might get a free renter along the way. So minimizing risk is a very big thing. A lot of people think, um, you know, Nathan, you just buy stuff and he's like flipping, and even some of my mates think that they're like, no, Nathan does that stuff. It's like, no, it's very, very calculated as to, um, you know, when I make those moves, it's like playing a, a game of chess. It's, you know, only speak when it's time to say check rate, right? Um, Josh, do you have any tips on how to buy out um, other half of portfolio from investing partner? Uh, it depends, very uh, you know, complex, everybody's position is very different. Um, you could just approach them and say, hey, look, it's not working, do you want to buy me out? Do you want, to, do you want me to buy you out? Um, you know, I don't go, hey, I'm gonna pay you this to buy you out, because they could be thinking, oh, well, are you trying to, you know, take the piss out of me or, uh, you know, are you going to pay me more or you must really want it? You know, always good to, yeah, do you want to buy me? Should I buy you? It's not really working. Um, I've got some goals. This is holding me back. This is one, two, three. Have a strategy and then, you know, position yourself correctly. If you need help on that, um, I do cover some of these uh, in map sessions and, and help people, you know, with strategy on that front. So, um, if you need help, have a chat, reach out to the office, send an email, give us a call. Um, you know, someone will find a way to be able to give you some ideas to um, to overcome you know the, the position that you're at. If you need help on a on a legal perspective, um, I've got a team of lawyers, I've got a law firm. Uh, if you need help on the financing aspect, I've got a finance company. If you need help on financial planning, I've got financial advisors in there um, to be able to uh, help you out. Tommy, evening champ, uh, with the current scamdemic, the likes of Terry Shear have an embargo, a new insurance policy, EBM is in the same situation, what are the alternative to these uh, are back at normal? Uh, thanks to your non-financial advice. Um, what I would suggest, Tommy, is, you know, which bank do you use, right? Go back to the bank that you use and then uh, say, oh, look, I've got this issue, I'm buying this asset, right? When you're getting a loan, you're in business with the bank, right? You're in business with them. They need to protect their asset, right? They need to protect you, right? If you fuck up, then they can take the property, but they need you to be alive. They want you, as part of their, their business model, they want you. So um, speak to your bank, that's probably the best place to see it to be at, um, or speak to um, uh, an insurance broker. There's insurance brokers out there that you know can, can get you some insurance, maybe even call, you know, around whoever handles your house. Like, I don't like these companies. Um, I try never to have a policy. I think I've got one because it was like, had a bit of flood in the back. It was like a big acreage and had a creek in the back. And uh, the other policy, those two main policy companies wouldn't um, give me insurance on it. And I um, I took it to like the same place where I get my car insured. And um, yeah, basically, uh, had to get insurance from there. So ring around. Um, I don't have exactly who has them at the moment, but I know that people are, um, are um, you know, getting insurance policies out there. Blair, uh, do you still look at those property forums? Um, 
I'm just not promoting them by saying them because they're like, you know, I see some of the, the fun stuff that people post out there. That's a very good question. Um, I recently got a, a attention to, uh, to some posts that are on some forums. So before Facebook, before Instagram, before, um, oh wow, I just won something else on eBay. It just popped up on my screen. Um, uh, people, um, I used to hop on the forums, right? I was uh, trying to pick up chicks in the early 2000s, like from like MSN and all those things, ICQ. Um, and then I used to like, just sit on property forums and um, I used to contribute a lot before, you know, technology caught up. And um, I see there's some haters out there that do like the post stuff. And I'm thinking, you're probably still in your parents' basement with Fawn, uh, you know, those that have seen Fawn on here that are, you know, it's a troll. Uh, and they're just hating. There's people that hate out there and they write, you know, oh, this guy's a dickhead. You know, look at what how crazy he is and, and whatnot. But I know, you know, a lot of those people that I've seen in meetups like 10 years ago, are still just the same people I can tell from their comments, right? And they hate, right? And that's cool, right? Because I know what I do, I know how I help, and all that sort of stuff. Um, so yeah, I do look at the, the forums out there occasionally. It's probably been years I don't contribute to any of the forums because I put a lot of content out there um, to YouTube, Facebook, and all that. And I don't need to go to the property forums for that. I find um, a lot of those property forums are absolutely useless. Um, there's all these you know people on there that are sort of got opinions, uh, full of opinions, full of doom and gloom, full of, oh, this can't happen, or this is going to happen, or hype, whatever the case may be. And they're like, just, it's like going to a senior's home and you've got all the like fucking whinging and shit. And um, yes, yeah, so I, don't, I don't get involved in that sort of stuff. But, but good luck with people on the forums. Like, there's nothing wrong with that. But just be careful what information you're taking in because there's a lot more information in the world where we are today than a couple of little forums that are sitting on the internet that have been housed from the early 2000s. So, um, yeah. Drew, uh, what sort of positive cash flow do you aim for per residential property? I like yields, sort of, you know, seven percent, ten percent. They make me happy. Uh, Fifteen, twenty percent make me happy sometimes. Um, sometimes I get up to like 50, 80, 90 percent uh, cash flow returns per annum. Um, but you know, the higher they are. Sometimes there is extra reasons why I'm getting like 90% and shit like that. There's problems with them. Um, however, um, you know, ideally for properties, neutral cash flow. Like if I'm buying a property in, you know, cool area of Sydney, which is, uh, positive, which is, um, you know, if it's worth, well, I just did a deal recently for my investors, um, which was very, very close to the city. Um, it was like 490, 510,000 um, for property. And um, they're worth like six fifty uh, any day of the week. You get a free car space with them. And um, these things, you're saying yes or no to one hundred fifty grand. Those things were negative, maybe like fifty bucks a week, hundred bucks a week. Um, so maybe like negative four, five grand tops to have a property, really top location, make it one hundred fifty grand. Pull out the one hundred fifty grand. If you could use that as like a deposit for three cheap positive cash flow properties. Get those three cheap positive cash flow properties. They offset that blue chip prime piece of real estate. Um, you know, and the other properties are still positive cash flow, blue chip prime real estate as well in capital cities. Um, you know, it's how you structure your portfolio. So sometimes they are slightly negative, slightly negative, slightly positive. Um, you know, ideally I want to go for neutral or positive cash flow though in my portfolio because it's more sustainable and especially in today's uh, lending environment. Um, Ben, hey Nathan, uh, where do you see yourself in 10, 15, 20 years still running businesses and accumulating assets? Uh, yeah, look, I just love collecting assets. Um, I mainly do what I do you know, here for fun. Um, you know, when I first started the business, um, you know, I was a very different person. Um, I was much younger, had more youth, um, had a big ego. Not really big, not, not cockhead ego, ego, but it was different. Um, but nowadays, when I look back, uh, there's cool stories I see from the community, uh, the lives that we touch, um, the people that you know come on to be a part of the journey. Right? Like as a part of the, the whole um, group of companies, there are like 100 staff that you know that are really excited and achieving their own personal goals, and you know it's, it's, it's humbling being a part of that. So that's why 
you know, there's not many people out there that are so eccentric and flippant and, you know, just say funny stuff and, you know, look at things the way that I do um, due to the fact that they, you know, they've got an agenda. And uh, for me, you know, I could make more money from a deal front. I could be doing developments. I could be doing more different stuff. However, you know, it's not in line, like, you know, it'd be boring and, um, you know, it would just be a different sort of lifestyle. So I find fun out of, uh, you know, what I do and a part of what I do. Ultimately, you know, I want to leave a legacy. I want to have children one day. I want to make sure that, you know, they've got something to go and be a part of. And, you know, uh, I'm building for different generations. I'm not just building for myself. Like, I've already covered myself. I could just go and retire, sit on the beach. Um, I always want to buy islands um, and, and whatnot, but it'd be, you know, owning an island would be hard work, upkeep, all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, like, what would you do? What would you do with your time? The reason why I started uh, this community, the reason why I started the business is that I had nothing to do when I quit my job 11 years ago. So, um, you know, seeing people, being around people, interacting with people, getting out of bed uh, in the morning, like, when I quit my job, uh, I see there's some people that pop on um, into uh, my Facebook lives, Instagram lives and whatnot um, that I used to work with like 11 years ago. And when I quit my job, it was like, fuck, we don't have to get out of bed. I used to wear a tie, I used to wear a shirt, I used to wear shoes, I used to wear a tie clip, cufflinks, whatever. Um, and yeah, like I didn't get out of bed for like a week. And then I was like thinking I've got like, all these terminal illnesses and whatnot I went crazy. So I just started making myself busy and I like, you know, making things happen. So in 10, 15, 20 years time, you would you know, probably still see me here or probably have you know, maybe more gray hair, hopefully still got hair, um, children and, you know, adding extra zeros to my net worth vision. This is more of a game for me now. It's not of a, uh, I'm not doing it for money. I'm not doing it. I, I could do a lot more things for money than what I do. It's more of, I just want to build things. I want to you know, push the boundaries of you know, society. I want to challenge them a lot. I love being able to sort of find information and help people on a very simple sort of level be able to understand complex situations. And I get a kick out of that because it's like, it's like giving people the red pill and then being able to you know, improve their lives. So that's why, you know, I get enjoyment out of what I do. And it's not for everybody too. It's not for everyone. People are like, fuck, I'd be at the beach if I was here. But, you know, I've got lots of mates. I'm like, why do you do it? Right? And some days I have stressful days. Um, but, you know, sometimes shit happens where I didn't sign up for. But it's part of what you do, right? And I think life's pretty good. So that's why I keep doing it. Um, uh, Man Rico, what do you think of Canberra's property market? I'm not a fan of it. Um, it's very, you know, which... Which commie do we want to vote in? Right? Is it Liberal or Labor? Um, and you know, Labor gets in, prices generally go up. If Liberal get in, doesn't really do much. Um, but oh, I just don't like Canberra. I don't. I don't know. It's just. It's not. It's not a place. There's, there's many other places, right? There's many other things that are happening. It's too regulated, too rigid. I think if we turn back in another twenty years' time, there might be some new government communist sort of building that's built down there. Um, and that's no offence to anyone from Canberra. It's just, it's just, I think there's other places to go and invest in. So um, there's lots of people that make money out of Canberra. There's a lot of people that do good in Canberra. There's a lot of uh, my community that are in Canberra. A lot of my mates come from Canberra. Uh, they know who they are. And um, yeah, I, I just, it's not, it's not somewhere that I don't like the territories personally um, to invest in, just personally. So. Um, Justin, hey, what's your thoughts on cross collateralizing any properties when building a property portfolio? Never, never, ever, ever cross your properties. If your broker is suggesting to cross them, we need to talk, Justin. Um, if your broker or bank manager has done, there's only like three reasons why they would do that. It's never for your benefit. One, they will do it because they are fucking lazy and don't want to put three loan applications, two loan applications, five loan applications through. They just do one and cross them all together. Two, um, they're trying to trap you into a loan product because then you can't get out. It's not for your benefit, right? 200 properties, I think maybe one or two where I've done a security swap, I sold a property, 
I've attached two new properties to that loan. So a lot of people don't realize you can make portable loans. You can um, you can get that loan and sell off the asset and attach a new asset to it. There's only been a couple of occasions where they've been structured that way. Um, and I think, I think I've had that happen twice out of 200 properties. And there was once when I had a whole pile of shit going down with, um, with loans and I had to settle stuff in bulk quickly. And I settled like three little shitters or like 100 grand, 120, 150 or something like that. And they'll attach. I would never, ever cross a property. Um, in my finance company, Zinger Finance, um, I have millions or billions of dollars worth of loans that we manage. Don't want to go in there and give everyone sort of where my business is at on that front. But, you know, um, from, you know, imagine billions of dollars worth of loans. None, not one loan in the history of my fucking business being in existence has anyone of my brokers ever done a cross collateralized loan, right? Um, brokers wouldn't even look at doing cross collateralized loan. Um, they wouldn't even know how to do a cross collateralized loan because we don't even fucking look at it. It's not a part of our, um, you know, language because it's so lazy. It's so committal. It screws up the investor. It's not in your best interest. You cannot build a sustainable property portfolio by having your properties cross collateralized. It will completely and utterly fuck you up. So if your properties are cross collateralized, reach out to me. If you are buying properties and your broker is suggesting to cross collateralize them, don't do it. Reach out. I'll make sure it gets there safely. Hey mate, just got quoted 23 grand to break my loan. What are your thoughts on refinancing? Fuck. Um, guys, there's so many people fixing rates. People are asking, should I fix rates? Rocco, um, sorry to hear that they're screwing you 23 grand uh, to break your loan. Um, there is different strategies. You know, it sounds like it's a chunky loan. It sounds like it's in for a long time. If you'd like to reach out to my team, um, just email my team at minutebeinvested.com.au. They'll put you in contact with my Zinger Finance team um, to um, to look at that and see if there's any way that we can minimise the, the blow. Um, some banks at the moment are um, offering refinancing incentives to refinance the properties, and they'll pay you like two grand or four grand to refinance. So hopefully that's not just one loan, and that's a couple of loans that you've got to pay that for. Um, like it's a combination of them and maybe there's a way of getting through it but um, if you do fix your property um, you are you know losing all your rights basically so just be very careful uh, Steve uh, hey Nathan love the content as always thanks mate sorry I haven't gotten back to your call um, I spoke to Linda tonight um, and I believe we're going to probably catch up on Thursday so we'll catch up soon keep on track of what we're doing on that um, uh, Geordie, um, do you still like Tamworth? Um, well, I've got nothing against Tamworth. Like, I purchase large blocks of units out there. I think someone's reselling them that I sold them to years ago. I bought a lot of units out there, blocks of units. Um, I just sold them because I needed to get cash and I own those things outright at the time. So I sold them to get, you know, millions of dollars worth of cash. Um, do I like it or not like it? Uh, I just bought them because they were cheap and they were the right vehicle for me at the day. Um, so I'll buy properties wherever, whatever types of properties they are, if they're in line with my goals, if they're in line with my strategy and they're in line with me getting to where I need to be. So if that happened to be in Tamworth, then great. But I don't see anything great out there at the moment that would be in line with my goals in, in Tamworth. Paul, when you will you consider fixing your mortgages? Kiyosaki just locked all these uh, down in, in preparation for massive inflation on the way. Um, I still believe we're going to see um, this be further drawn out. They're going to be printing more and more money. So when interest rates go down a little bit lower, that's when I'll be fixing. Um, I don't see myself fixing any time throughout um, this year. Um, and, and once again, as I just said before, I'm not fixing interest rates. So I'm not a financial advisor. I'm not a mortgage broker. I can't give you guys you know, independent uh, individual financial sort of advice. So this is all of generic nature of me talking about stuff that comes to my mind. Um, just in case we've got some commies in here watching and they're like, oh, I'm going to try and get Nathan if something comes out of his mouth. Good luck. Um, with um, with the mortgages, um, you know, if you do lock your rates in, just like um, I think it was Rocco beforehand that said, um, he's got to pay 23 grand to, uh, to break his fees, right? So now you've, you could be in a position where you've got to pay 20 grand to unlock half a million dollars equity. So it's either pay 20 grand, be patted down by the banks and then roll you, 
um, because you've screwed up from restructuring wrong, um, in order to be able to get access to your capital in order to uh, acquire new assets. So yeah, just be very careful of fixing rates. Um, Luke, hey Nathan, I did a map session with Daniel a few years back and got me into uh, rent vesting. Glad that I did so. I've booked a strategy session with you next week and looking forward to catching up with you. Thanks for the great content. Cheers. Thanks, Luke. I look forward to chatting with you next week. Um, Daniel, he's out there. You know, he's um, He's got properties. I had a business partner, Daniel, lovely guy, good mate. Um, and yeah, he's out there just traveling, not so much nowadays because of you know, lockdown and everything. But um, yeah, he's been able to use property to get himself to you know live life on his terms, and everybody's goals are, are different. So um, yeah, but good to hear that you know that Dan was able to you know give you the motivation and the inspiration and the knowledge to go out there and kick ass uh, with your journey, and look forward to being able to you know have a revamp on that that session and be able to guide you for the next level of your journey. So look forward to it, Luke. Uh, Jit, Nathan, do you think Australia banks will go into negative interest rates? I believe so. Uh, there is so much manipulation in the system. We should be in negative rates already. Um, however, due to the level of manipulation out there, will we end up seeing it? Who knows, right? We're almost at zero. We're at 25 basis points and in the real rate range, we are at zero. We are at zero, but they just call it 25 basis points because you know, you've got to leave a couple of cents on the table. So. Will we go negative? I believe so. When will that happen? Who knows? It's going to be a very, very uh, exciting time as we go into negative interest rates. We're definitely going to see massive inflation. Um, what are your thoughts? Uh, will happen once to rents once the seven hundred fifty dollar a week job keeper ends at five fifty job seeker ends? Um, you know, if you're in the top end of town and you're getting, uh, you know, job keeper, it's still not going to be enough to pay for the high end of rent. It's not really going to affect anything. Uh, if you're in the bottom end of town. And um, you know it's you know it's covering a whole wage or, or whatever. Um, you know there's always going to be some sort of program there to help and to support that in the market. That's why I like the lower end type of assets that have got like a two, three, four hundred dollar a week rental return, not the big ticket items which are like thousand bucks a week, eight hundred bucks a week, and that sort of stuff. Um, will people be in trouble? Time will tell. Will they extend past? Um, you know, I think that they keep saying they're going to cancel JobKeeper, JobSeeker because they don't want to have people relying on it too much. But I believe with a very good gut feeling that they will have to keep and extend this in some sort of capacity. It's called a universal basic income past uh, September. So it will be interesting. Does the age of property ever affect your decision as to whether to purchase the property because whether you can claim depreciation or not on it? Um, no, I don't buy for tax benefits, just it's the bonus. Over my portfolio, I've got lots of deductions that I can claim. Um, however, you know, speak to an accountant. Um, I did a webinar the other week with Ridwan Hannon from One Path Accountants. If you are, um, you know, I've, I've put Ridwan on there beforehand. If you have got a position, speak to an accountant that understands, uh, you know, property investing and whatnot. Um, the um, the I'm just reading another message here. That's that's cool. Thanks, Danielle, for that. I'll get to in a moment, but um. Uh, I don't buy it for the tax deduction. I'm buying it due to the fact of the fundamentals. Uh, I have properties that are like 100 years old. I've got properties that are fibro, asbestos roof. Uh, it's got, I think it's got like a six sheet, which is the, the wavy asbestos, asbestos gutters. Um, you know, I'll buy any sort of property for number stack up. The fundamentals have to be right. Tax is just a, a bonus. But if you need help on the tax side of things, reach out to my office. We'll put you in contact with Rid One. One Path Accountants is my firm. Uh, Danielle has just written to Tommy saying try CHU Landlord Insurance. CHU Landlord Insurance, not a financial advisor, it's just a comment that's been posted here. Someone has suggested that that's someone that's lending at the moment, so it could be, yeah. Uh, Sam, do you regret becoming such a public figure doing interviews about your property success? Um, sometimes, like, there's hate out there some days. And people are like, oh, look at this dickhead. But I actually don't care anymore. Right? I don't care. I used to get upset about it when I first started going out there. I put myself in the media. I did that. Uh, I know there's haters out there all the time. Um, and you know, I'm going to have a lot more haters in uh, in the future. Um, I've, I had uh, a hater today uh, watching. I right? um, hope you're enjoying the legal letter that got sent to you um, from my corporate lawyer in house. Uh, but yeah, I get haters, I get people that try and, you know, oh, you do this or whatever. It never works. I don't negotiate with terrorists. Um, but I have had, 
you know, idiots that come over the years and try and, you know, push their way around and, um, you know, it's made me a better person as well, having to face those things. So I'm cool with where my life's at. Sometimes I think, you know, simple life, people talk to me about, oh, you know, you know, what about this, what about this? I don't put everything out there. I try and have a bit of a, you know, personal life and, you know, all my family and whatnot. Um, so yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't put it all out there, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm cool with it. Uh, any thoughts on Richard Branson, Tim Ferriss, etc. why they outsource most of their day-to-day uh, -day work, so they only work one to two hours a day, and the rest of the time they're spent on travel, playing sports, partying, etc. Um, well, uh, I don't think that they necessarily do all of that. Um, they've got a team, or they could be a brand ambassador. It depends on what sort of structuring their business is. Um, you know, for, you know, a lot of these people, you know, if you look at Richard Branson, right, he's outsourced a lot of his work over many, many years. Um, he's more of a marketing person, um, but I'm sure he does a lot more work than, you know, what we all see, right? Because the hustle to control it, right? Like the amount of energy that goes in to keep something effective, right? If we say there's no um, oil in the car, right? Well, then the car's not going to be able to move because it's not full of the energy to, to, to make it effective, the momentum to make it effective. So, yeah, like, I'm a big fan of trying to outsource as much stuff as I can. I, I, you know, I don't wash my shirts, I don't iron my shirts. Um, that's why I didn't wear shirts for years, right? I just like the fact that I put the t-shirt on, and, you know, and just wash it and it's, 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 it's good to go. But um, yeah, with it, um, I like to outsource. I think everybody should outsource as much as they, um, as they can, um, so they can spend their time, um, you know, being able to, you know, do things that are important to them. For me, at this point in my life, I'm just trying to make cool shit happen and, and grow and expand. And I said to everybody very publicly a few years ago that I wanted to be a billionaire by 40. It's not a billionaire because I want to have like some you know, Lambos and chicks and all that sort of stuff. It probably was at some point, but um, I wanted to be a billionaire just because you know, something cool, right? And uh, for me, like being billion, um, we'll all probably be billionaires in our lifetimes because our currency will be devalued so much that uh, inflation will destroy it. So it's, it's just interesting. Uh, Gregory, hey mate, how you doing? Uh, Jono, hey Nath, regarding fixing loans, what is the benefit for the bank to fix you for a long period of time after the rates bottom? Won't it be the best interest to keep you variable? No, so if you fix a two year interest rate, for example, at the moment, let us assume that the lowest rate occurs in 12 months time. You have a fixed rate, you can't fix it in 12 months time for five years. So I think the duration of the loan is important. Um, and generally, like, why would they have a lower uh, fixed rate if the interest rates are gonna go up? They would have them up higher. So um, you can sort of have indication of where lending's going by seeing you know, how they're actually promoting their products and, and whatnot, there's like, interest rates are cheaper to fix than they are to, to be variable. So when people think they're gonna go um, and, and be um, uh, cheaper, uh, more expensive in the future, like they're showing you that they're gonna be cheaper. So uh, one other thing on that uh, point is some brokers, some banks, some lenders, they have things called clawbacks. So if you refinance your loan in the first two years of whatever it is, then, um, you know, they lose their commission. They have to pay the commission back from you refinancing that loan out. So a lot of brokers will actually fix for two years and, you know, lock you in for that period of time so they know that you're not, they're not going to lose their commission um, in the future from that. Um, so what is your thoughts on buying hotels, motels, converting them? Um, I'm going to... I'm going to um, uh, ended at this last message here. There's two more to go um, and a couple more questions in Instagram just before I go because I need to get get out of here. Um, what are your thoughts on buying hotels, motels, converting them to long-term residential tenancies with building zoning allows? Um, I've had it work good and positive in some aspects and not so good in other aspects. I own sort of a handful of motels, sort of like four, five, six motels um, and a couple of them uh, running as, you know, motel, and some of them aren't running as motel, they're just running as, you know, boarding house and whatnot. Um, I have had some issues with council on two of the occasions. Um, would I suggest you go do it? Probably not. Um, 
Have I done well out of them? Yes. Have they caused me grief? Yes. That's why my chin beard looks like I've got a moustache because the bottom of my chin is grey because it brings me stress. So, yeah. Um, I would do it, but it's not... I have done it, um, but I think it's other ways out there to make money without the risk of added extra elements into my life. So, yeah. Uh, fun. <laughs> fun. We haven't seen him for a while. Or her. Um, now, if positive cash flow in regional properties, your thoughts, um, if the deal works and stacks up for you, do it. If it's in line with your strategy, your goals, um, do it. Make sure that you're buying the right assets in line with your goals. That's the most important, the most crucial part of your investing journey. Make sure that, that asset, ask yourself the question, right? Whether it be that you're getting doing a tax return, whether it be that you're getting a financial advice, whether it be that you're getting a new loan product, whether it be that you're selling a property, buying a property, ask yourself, how is this um, action that I'm about to take going to get me closer to my goals? Is it going to get me closer? Is it going to get me further away? Is it going to cause an opportunity cost in the middle? How's it going to help me in a longer term picture get to my goals? That's the question you need to be asking yourself at all points in time. So uh, on that note, I'm just going to check. I saw a couple of messages in here. Uh, where do I see Victoria moving in the future, investing metro or regional? I actually like some regional areas of Victoria. Um, um, yeah, with it, um, not that I'm saying go by Victoria, but um, you know, am I against it? Am I anti it? No. Am I for it? No. Just see that there is some opportunities out there that I'd like to speculate in the not too distant future. Um, I think there's much better states than. Victoria. Uh, the reason being is that uh, if we look at Sydney, we're surrounded by Blue Mountains, National Parks, Central Coast, water, whatnot. If you look at Melbourne, you could basically keep building every five minutes all the way out to Albury and just gobble up the whole plane of, of land. So um, as for supply and demand, there's more uh, supply in Victoria and Melbourne than there is in Sydney. That's why you know, I said there's better opportunity in, in Sydney. Uh, thanks, mate. Heaps. Uh, we have purchased three properties just by watching YouTube clips in like 2014. Uh, don't done good, mate. Keep up the good work. I really appreciate the, the feedback. Right, there. there's no, uh, you know, one comes with a, a Logie's award and say, oh, you know, he's done a great job. Uh, but just hearing, you know, you guys sharing your stories and your journey is is, is very humbling to myself and to my my team and. You know, the, the team put in a lot of work as well to make sure that you know, things come out, communications come out are really, um, really, really you know, important for you guys. So I appreciate the feedback on that. If you need help on, on, on financing or restructuring anything or, or whatever, feel free to, uh, to hit up my team and make sure that we, uh, we get you on the, the right track and push you forward to the next level. Everyone's in a different position. If you're at five, you get to 10. If you're at 10, you want to get to 20. If you're at one, you want to get to two. Um, and life travel, looking sharp. Appreciate the uh, the the um, the the, uh, the feedback. Uh, thoughts in Kalunga. Um, I have bought some properties there for people beforehand. I actually did one. I bought a property in Kalunga for one of my investors uh, late last year for one hundred and sixty thousand dollars. They pulled out equity and was able to buy another property afterwards from that one. So I'll buy anywhere if the numbers stack up. Um, yeah, I'll buy anywhere if the numbers stack up. So. Um, what is with the tie? As I was saying to everyone at the start, um, I've just been wearing some more professional attire because, um, you know, I've got more staff, I've got, uh, you know, a new team of people that is growing, expanding. I want to have a different level of leadership uh, than what I've been having in the past in the business. I've just thought wearing a tie every now and then sort of, uh, you know, shows that, you know, I'm, I'm putting in the effort for them to be on point. So if I'm putting a suit on for the fun of it no shoes right it's always wearing the thongs with the suit i've got a pair of old man thongs just they look like more professional sort of thongs um but yeah just you know you've got the expectations are set right um on that note i've got one last question i'm going to answer and it looks like a good one um andrew said asked uh, when you have done security swaps in the past was it a requirement to have simultaneous settlement it just depends on the loan facility uh, as I keep banging on to everybody, a debt strategy is very, very crucial. A debt strategy. Everyone thinks of an acquisition strategy. Everyone thinks of a renovation strategy. A debt strategy. Working out how to acquire the debt, 
working out how to repay the debt is very, very crucial um, in, in, in building out that portfolio. Um, if you have a, a lender, which is a non-deposit taking lender, then you have to do a security swap immediately. Um, so for example, if I'm selling a property and I want to buy a new property, that property, the two properties must exchange and settle at the same time because uh, they can't keep your loan open if they are a deposit taking institute. And if you have the right loan facility, then a lot of the time you can park the loan aside and, um, and have like a fixed term account attached as a security rather than a property. And then when you go to get the new asset, you just take the cash out of the fixed term account, crack it open and, um, and use that to purchase a property. So um, yeah, if you need help on setting out that debt plan, just finally uh, reach out to my team, admin at beinvested.com.au, uh, 1300 367 925. Uh, we're here to help, here to serve, and here to help you guys kick ass with your journey. Thanks a lot for tuning in. Um, and on that note, I will see you guys next Tuesday. Bye for now.